much. So presidents, the European Council is meeting at a very crucial moment, at a very crucial time, and colleagues have been mentioned that. There is a lot of tasks, a lot of challenges ahead, and it's vital that we get it right. So I really hope the Council can send an important signal for Europe, for solidarity, and for human rights. And for that, I wish you all the best success and good luck. And if you do so, then of course we're ready to support you. But from the Council conclu conclusions we've seen so far, unfortunately we cannot expect that, but I hope you can change that. Thank you. Frau Keller, es gibt eine Frage des Herrn Ab. Mrs. Keller, there's a question from Mr. Etheridge for you. Go ahead. Good morning and uh, Merry Christmas. Congratulations on your new role. Uh, there's a lot of passion about Aleppo today. Do you agree with me, first of all, obviously, that war is best avoided? Now, the ways to avoid war would be, first of all, to stop crazy foreign interventions that are totally unnecessary, to stop political posturing that pushes people like crazy tyrants in Russia to the edge of having to respond, but also that peace can be best achieved through strength, and strength is best achieved through NATO, not some harebrained scheme of European defence armies that will never work, absolutely preposterous, and thank God will never in future have UK troops in them. Thank you for the question. I think this, we are the strongest if we work together in a European cooperation. We're stronger together. We can move things in the world together. And we need to do so, always having a mind in mind to achieve peace, to achieve human rights, and to achieve democracy and the values that all human beings achieve, um, want to achieve. Because we're all striving for peaceful existence. We're all striving to have our rights respected. And we're all striving to have freedom and to have our voices heard. Thank you. For the, EFDD, for the EFDD group, the next speaker will be Mr. Farage. Well, I think we can all agree that 2016 has been a momentous, indeed, historic year. And as it's Christmas, let's think of those events in terms of the three wise men bearing their gifts. First, we had the Brexit deliverance. Then we had the Trump triumph. And then thirdly, of course, the Italian rebellion. It's just that in this case, the gifts were all the same. Democracy and the rebirth of the nation state. And I really think you'd better listen, because I know in the past you've managed to ignore Danish, Dutch, Irish and French referendums, but this time it is for real. A democratic revolution has begun. And yet, when the 28 leaders of the EU countries meet tomorrow, on the agenda I see no sign of humility, I see no understanding of what has happened at all. In fact, what I see is the implementation plan of the EU global strategy on security and defence. In simple English, EU militarisation, the building of a European army, and indeed Mr Juncker used Donald Trump's magnificent victory to say, well, that means that NATO won't be here anymore. We have to do this ourselves, is what you said. And I think this is a huge and dangerous error. Trump is not a threat to NATO. He wants it to be redefined and he wants the members to pay their way. It is Mr. Juncker who is a threat to NATO. And you can pretend today, if you like, that your military structure is going to run in parallel with NATO, but those two structures cannot run together without being in direct conflict with each other. It was Tony Blair that first really worried me about this project when he said the rationale for the EU today is not peace, it's about power. And already we've seen that power exercised in terms of foreign policy in the Ukraine, where we have wantonly provoked Russia into, and we actually got rid of a democratically elected leader. You know, history is littered with conflicts caused by empires that seek to expand. And it's about time the British government actually stood up tomorrow and said, enough. This is madness. And we as an independent United Kingdom will act as the bridge between America and the nation states of Europe to make sure that NATO is secure. 
Uh, I also hope tomorrow that we see uh, the British Prime Minister stop dithering uh, on Brexit. It's been six months since we voted for our liberation, and at the minute we're being dictated to by courts and European commissioners and told what we can and cannot do. I hope we do that, uh, but I suspect we won't, and I suspect the other 27 leaders will continue on the same course, and that's why you can all look forward to some even bigger dramatic shocks coming what we can and cannot do. I hope we do that, uh, but I suspect we won't, and I suspect the other 27 leaders will continue on the same course, and that's why you can all look forward to some even bigger dramatic shocks coming in 2017. It's going to be, for nation-state Democrats, a very happy New Year. I've got a question from Mrs. Infelt for you. Mrs. Infelt. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just something that you said that I would like to uh, uh, ask your clarification. You say dictated by the courts. So do I understand that you now officially say that you no longer accept the independence of the courts, one of the pillars of democracy and the trias politica? A yes or no answer, please. Well, Tony Blair did his absolute best to politicise a civil service that had been made neutral by Gladstone 140 years earlier. Uh, and yes, it, of, course, of course it's true. We have some people sitting in judgment who have actively been engaged in the process of European unity. And they, in those specific cases, should, I think, have absented themselves. But the real point I'm making is dithering. Had the new Prime Minister triggered Article 50 immediately, there'd be no court cases. We wouldn't have Monsieur Barnier talking down to us. We'd be getting on with doing the best we can under Article 50. Though I'm concerned, listening to your colleague Mr Verhofstadt, that once we trigger Article 50, it may become so unworkable that we simply have to say we're going goodbye. Okay, das Wort hat jetzt für die The next speaker on behalf of the ENF group is Mr. De Graaf. I'd love it if you just take your speeches down to that level. Yes or no? Wonderful. If you want to speak, then you have the right to ask for the floor. Mr. De Graaf. Vorige week werd in President, last year an illegal mm -hmm. Afghan was detained for rape and murder a 19-year-old girl who was in the prime of her life. She was working actively for the reception of migrants and she was the daughter of an EU official. It could have been your daughter, she could have been my daughter. Politicians and the media talk about this as an incident, but in Germany there have been many rapes, thefts, perpetrations of violence, and all and many of them by illegal immigrants. This commission is refusing to recognize that there's a structural problem here. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of incidents such as this, but you are never actually prepared to concede that this is a structural problem. These illegal immigrants are convinced that they have a right to come to our countries and, if they so wish, to rape our women and our children. Yes, our children, because women and children, even at the age of five or ten, have been murdered, they have been raped, and you are refusing to recognize that you are in part responsible for allowing this to happen because you won't recognize that we need a structural solution to migration in our countries and our cities. Nothing has been done to stop these illegal immigrants. You're working with a dictator in Turkey. You're working effectively with people who represent Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra, the murderers in Homs, in Mosul, and f uh, way beyond that. You are largely responsible, and this is the message which will come out of the Council this week. It's high time we had proper borders, we sent illegal migrants back, we stopped Islamization of Europe, and we stopped negotiations with Turkish, which should never have been started. Thank you. Herr de Graaf. Now, Mr. de Graaf. Oh, Mr. Verhofstadt. Mr. De, Mr. de Graaf, I just have a request for you.
to say that migrants or refugees are systematically carrying out rapes. Well, I think after what we heard yesterday from two migrants who were systematically raped, then I think it's a shame and a scandal. It's a, you bring shame upon the European Parliament from what you said. See, I'm on the... Mr. Mrs. Altman, do you have a question? A microphone for the speaker. Meneer de Graaf, u uit... Mr. de Graaf, your uh, statements are absolutely intolerable. They have no place in this house. Europe stands up for the rights of women, for the rights of every citizen. Your statements are nothing short of racism, pure racism. You're treating all the migrants as if they are one and the same. You're talking about people murdering and raping women and children. This is absolutely sickening speech. And, uh, President, I'd ask for this to be deleted from the minutes. This is absolutely not worthy of the European Parliament, this type of speech. <laughs> President, that didn't sound like a question to me. It was a comment. Now, one hears many comments. People saying, for example, that this parliament stands up for the rights of women and children in Europe. Well, I think, uh, Madam, that we need actions. And I'm not aware that I've seen you doing anything for the women who are the victims in our cities of all these illegal migrants. So, that's what I did, sir. The next speaker is Mr. Papadakis. Thank you. Well, you can't expect anything else from the fascists. The capitalist economy imposes this. There's no centre of uh, decision-making that can really develop the economy. This is true in the EU and the Eurozone as well. There are obstacles posed to development by big banks, and they mean that uh, uh, just we see new wars. It's a uh, bourgeois system and just leads to protectionism. We're seeing that in the United States, in Italy, and in the UK. People work for others. Uh, workers work for the middle class uh, and bring benefits to uh, the rich. Uh, we're even seeing it in Greece. People should revolt against these forces because all they're doing is carrying forward the uh, interests of capitalists. We want to see an alliance of workers to break uh, this capitalist barbarity. Thank you very much. On behalf of the EPP group, Mr. Hoyle. President, Spad President, President of the Council, Commission President. Well, I must say I'm just absolutely speechless. If you see all of this chaos in Europe, where we hear people getting nervous, people feeling insecure, that there is constant populism, people need to do something about it, well, it's clear that we can't continue to, with, this, uh, with just making promises. We actually have to deliver. We, people need to see that some things are changing. I think the best uh, comment we heard this morning was from President Juncker. He said, we have made progress. We have actually achieved progress. We have moved forward. We have delivered. That's how to win back the trust of the people. It's important as a precondition for that, that we work well together and that we're capable of acting. That means the council is capable of taking decisions. That's something we've complained about and off in the past. But that also means that we in the parliament have to get our act together as well. Now, colleagues, I really am shocked, dumbfounded, amazed, astounded. This is not the time for particle, party political squabbling. I've seen that often enough in my political career, but now is not the time for it. Because, I mean, the winners will be on the far left and the far right outside. 
They've got Mr Farage saying, success is Brexit, success is Trump, success is the Italian referendum. Well, if that's what we want, if that's success, well, let's keep squabbling. I'm happy to take part in that, but uh, I think that we should follow what Mr Juncker said. Progress, step by step, making uh, progress. That's what people are paying us for, that's what people expect of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Roy. There's a blue card for you. Will you accept it? Il y a une carte bleue. Blue card. Will you take it? Uh, dear colleague, you mentioned that we have to take action. In fact, the council is going to speak about migration, security issues, economic and social development, youth, external relations, Russia, Ukraine. Don't you think so? It's time that you know the European Council, altogether the European Commission, and with the European Parliament, should have to come with a new strategy, a new plan for a new beginning of the European Union in order to attract again European Union citizens' support for this important pan European project? Nee, ich glaube überhaupt nicht noch einen Plan. Da haben wir genug von. Sondern ich möchte ergeben... Well, I think we've got enough of plans. We've had plans and plans and plans. We've got proposals from the Commission. We've got decisions that we've taken. But just for some of this, the Council actually has to manage to get its act together. And sometimes it's us who are being asked to decide. We shouldn't just squabble, we should decide. That's my point. Thank you. Mr. Guerrero Salam, two minutes. Thank you. It's at the end of this year, 20... At the end of next year, 2017, I very much hope we can say it's been a year of at least a certain amount of uh, consistency, at least in our um, diagnosis of reality and the cure we apply to it. If our diagnosis is that we have the same problems as we did in 2014, then the cure is going to have to be a complete review of the multi-annual financial framework. If the diagnosis is that European citizens feel unprotected against globalization, then we're going to have to move forward um, with European employment, with a minimum wage and more protection for workers. If our diagnosis is that we need investment in order to ensure growth and employment, then what we can't do is put the brakes on the 50 uh, billion additional uh, in euros in funding as the Eurogroup ministers did. We have to change our behaviour and we have to ensure consistency between what we see before our eyes and the um, cure that we apply to it to try to solve our problems. I think dealing with Aleppo is going to be a fundamental issue for the upcoming council to deal with. What we want to achieve is humanitarian access and access for food and medicine. And to work politically to try to solve this issue with Europe uh, making its contribution. But we don't just have problems in Aleppo, there are, in Aleppo, there are problems in Greece. There are a lot of organizations that are telling us that the conditions in which many of the refugees in Greece are facing are unbearable and inhumane. We want to move these refugees to safe sites where they'll be protected, not just their uh, lives are protected, but also their rights and their dignity. Mrs. Fatiga for one minute. I reiterate on CSDP the importance to reach the NATO defense expenditures target. On Ukraine, with full respect for Dutch people, uh, full ratification is a matter of urgency and necessity. On Aleppo, there is crime against humanity going on there. We have to ensure there is no impunity for those who are physically and politically responsible for it, regardless to rank and, and nationality. Thank you. Mr. Telichka, 1.30. Minister, yesterday we had many of us tears in our eyes. Some of us were crying, facing uh, two young Yazidi girls that uh, had the braveness and dec decisiveness that uh, we lack. Now, is it that much different from what is happening today in Aleppo? Uh, I would like to avoid a situation that any year or two years' time we will be awarding uh, 
Sakharov Prize to someone that managed to escape from Aleppo. And if you look at the European Council conclusions of the draft of those, we say we keep all options open. That is two days ago. Now I understand that the situation has evolved further, but it has not evolved dramatically in comparison to what we were two, three, five days ago, a week ago, two weeks ago. So I think that this is really high time to act. And I mean really act, take decisions. This is what is expected. The second issue that I would like to raise is Turkey. I agree with President Juncker that there has been enormous progress uh, in uh, uh, tackling the migration issue with Turkey. I mean, there are positive signs. But I need to take that aside from one other issue, an issue on which this parliament has been practically united, and we have called for freezing, seizing the negotiations with Turkey. There are something like uh, Copenhagen uh, uh, criteria for membership, for conducting negotiations. There are people put in prison, there are people being persecuted, maybe killed, and we continue negotiations on accession with Turkey. You must be kidding me. Thank you, Mr. Hadjidjo. Thank you, Mr. Hadjidjo. Thank you, Mr. Hadjidjo. Thank you, Mr. Hadjidjo. Thank you, Mr. Juncker. I think you have probably heard that we are all pleading with you to tell us what you're going to do and what we should do. We are all responsible. The point is that we are failing to take on the responsibility that we should properly shoulder. We are all responsible and it is a weighty responsibility that we share for the terrible death factory which is existing in Syria now. We gave the award to the women who were here yesterday, the young women who came to receive the Sakharov Prize, and yet what are we doing in areas such as Syria? We need to put our words into actions. We need to do something much more constructive. Equally, in terms of Cyprus and the peace negotiations there, the unification talks, we need to ensure that some action is actually taken in order to ensure that there is proper security for the people of the island, because the people of Cyprus are as entitled as anybody else to have proper representation and to have uh, respect for their views.